Ja. Soundcheck. All right, well, that's awful, but it'll do. Welcome back to Bayesian Cognitive Modeling. It's our final episode. So far in the series, we have gone through and done every exercise in Wagemacher and Lee's book. Bayesian Cognitive Modeling, a practical course where we have learned how to conduct Bayesian inference from top to bottom by learning generally about what are the goals of this sort of analysis, what are the key steps that we are need to take during each workflow when conducting Bayesian inference. What are some of the particular things that we need to know about our sampling procedure? And then we moved into doing some actual data analysis on some examples, but using fake data in order to do parameter, just say standard parameter estimation. And then we moved into looking at some more practical examples or how could we conceptualize doing or building statistics that we know and what we would commonly do in other types of ways to do statistics such as frequencies analysis how do we incorporate latent mixtures? So how do we infer underlying groups from our data? What sort of questions are pertinent to doing such an, a type of inference in the first place? And then we moved into well, how can we do hypothesis testing in a Bayesian framework? And what are some of the challenges to doing such a thing? And then we learned how to do standard statistical inference tests such as p-tests using a Bayesian framework. And then we moved into some case studies where we looked at a series of cognitive process models across memory, attention, perception, categorization, and we looked at how could we, and even risk taking, and we looked at how could we build cognitive models using Bayesian inference and then answer real world questions that are of interest to cognitive scientists. And so that, to do so, such a thing, we took all the steps we learned from the previous chapters and put them into one. And now here we are on our last chapter, which we briefly touched on um, the last episode we set the, the stage for. So go check that out if you haven't seen the um, day 29, where we started talking about children's development of concepts related to um, numbers. So the development of numeracy how do we capture this effect? And what are some, what is a one particular developmental theory for understanding the development of numeracy? And what are two tasks that might capture this differences in the development of numeracy? And how can we go about incorporating, well, first extracting knowledge from the task behavior while accounting for the particular limitations of what we can capture or measure using the task. And then how can we use several tasks in one modeling framework 
and then infer information about our theory which we specified in the overarching model model but now we do so while incorporating knowledge about the task specific paradigms so we have we're going to look at the two give n and fast cards here and i'll talk through some of the particulars of the tasks again um, just to set the stage but overall that's like a brief overview <laughs> of what we've done over the past 29 days and uh, you know, we are going to finish the book here strong um, so let's get right into it all right Also, so apologies for the background noise. I'm starting to pick up. I hear it. Oh, and my voice is a little echoey today. But I I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, I'm not in my normal streaming location tonight, but I wanted to finish off the stream strong close this 30-day challenge um, as soon as possible I know you know we already missed one day a couple days ago so I didn't want to miss another day so making up for it with this May 1st stream because it also will close the book okay so let's find the chapter then Okay, here we are. So we're gonna be, we're gonna start like we've done in most chapters or all chapters prior. We're gonna talk a little bit about what's the theory we're interested in, in the content domain. Then we're gonna see how we go about specific specifying um, such a theory into a mathematical model so that's the big you know, jumping point i think the big um, takeaway from this this book is that you know we have these verbal theories and we want to translate them into mathematical frameworks that we can then go about using bayesian inference to test both our hypotheses and um, estimate um, parameters that are theoretically interesting based on the um, development or the uh, conversation that we had between our verbal theories and the mathematical framework that we set up. So in this case, we're looking at the, the cognitive development of understanding number concepts and we're thinking about knowledge level theory, which um, is a developmental theory that talks about how uh, children learn um, the cardinal meaning of only a couple numbers and then from that meaning they do inductive leaps in order to understand um, numbers beyond those numbers and they have these uh, categories set up which are labeled uh, <laughs> naturally as knower one knower two knower three and knower four and then pre knowers so before knowing any numbers um, and the theory also states that most people don't become knower fours but many people children become knower threes at least and with those numbers you can then infer all the other information you need about other numbers so if I know about one for example I know what ten is and that's what the theory would look for and this development then continues until people become what's called cardinal principle knowers. 
CP Nellis. So in order to assess that theoretical paradigm, uh, they have experimental tasks that have been developed. And the two tasks we're interested in here are the given and the fast car. And to talk a little bit about the given, children are asked in an experimental setting to either buy a, a funny note, uh, they're either asked by experimenters or they're asked by puppets, uh, which is cool. So if you're a developmental psychologist and you get to ask kids to give you toys or candy with a, a hand puppet, that's probably fun. <laughs> so kids are asked to trade, like uh, give me like 10 of whatever things. And if you know, they get it correct, then that counts as being correct answer um, incorrect identified as incorrect and then they also log the size of the amount of items they asked them to give so with all that information they from that task they're able to infer a child's knower level whether they're um, correspond to the knower levels that I specified above. And then with the fast cards, children are asked to look at a image or on a card, look at what's on the card. And then they're asked a set of questions about particular things related to the card. For example, you know, the card could have four cows on it and the kid could be asked how many cows are on the card? Or, or the kid could be asked, are there 10 cows on this card? All right, so you see then from that, you get a yes or no response. It's, it's a correct answer or not. And it also records information about the particular number that the child was asked to make an inference on all of which give you enough information in order to understand and place a child in one of those categories we talked about above. So you see both the give n and the fast card tasks are two different experimental paradigms that allow us to capture information about a child's developmental theory or developmental stage in their understanding of numeric concepts. However, because both of these tasks do that process differently, that means that it's important when we're developing these uh, mathematical specifications that we account for task-specific components uh, within the behavioral data. Right? So, for example, they give a nice example in the book where in the given task, If you ask the child to give you 15 toys and the child didn't know what 15 was, well, it's likely that they just give you all the toys they had. In fact, um, even if they didn't have 15 toys, if you ask them to give you 15 toys and they didn't know what 15 meant, then most children tend to give the experimenter all the toys because they're, this is a number beyond what I know. So it must be big. But in the fast card task, the asking a kid about 15 is, does it make sense? Um, there's nothing special about 15 in this task setting. Right, so unlike in the give and task, the number 15 isn't attached to any particular um, component of the task. And so inferring information about a child's 
numeric competency from that information is not as uh, readily available using that knowledge. So it's, it's nicely just gotten the text in this way. And so let's move to taking a look at how we went about or how they go about specifying this knower level model mathematically uh, via the graphical model that we know and love and we've seen throughout episodes all throughout the whole series and so in this case we're going to be looking at a subset from an, an experiment done by um, Lee and Sar Sarneka 2010 and there we're going to be looking at a subset of the children from an experiment that they did where they uh, had children take both the given and the fast end um, and then attempted to model both of these simultaneously which we'll see in the examples to come on how to incorporate that but right now we're just going to look at the given. So we're going to see how to specify a model for the given task. And before we read about some of the parameterization here, I'm just going to take some educated guesses about what are some of the components of this uh, graphical model. And then we'll, like we've done in the past, I guess and check. We'll see how we did. So here is the given task, and we have two plates. We have one plate for children and then one for the questions. And so we have two discrete observed parameters here, A sub IJ and A sub IJ, or Q sub IJ, A sub IJ, right? And they seem to be represented by or distributed as a categorical distribution with pi prime ij where pi prime ij is proportional to pi sub k or v times pi ikj or one over V times pi I K J. So it looks like there are three different classifications for which pi I K J can be specified. And in this case, so it looks like each child for a given, uh, given question for some k specification which i'm not sure yet which i think it might represent the, the number that they had to give each of those is going to have some pi prime which is then used to specify a given child for a given questions distribution And we have these group level parameters here, V from one to a thousand and pi. Okay. So we have this child level parameter of Z. So I'm gonna guess that Z I, since it's only on the subject level, is going to be our latent mixture parameter since it's also discrete here, you know, we can tell by the square. So that means that Z is going to provide us information about which particular level of knower a, a given child is. So whether they're a pre-knower or whether they're a level one knower or a cardinal knower, etc.
let's get right into it and let's see what the the model says then. Seems like each child has a task specific prior. So this theory relies on children conducting this sort of probabilistic updating of their understanding when they're asked a question. So this updating can be explained by two things. In the first, it's, let's see, the problem is updating parameters I see so children have base rate task specific priors on their number knowledge and two things can occur either they understand a number and when they're asked the number they understand that number and then the child's prior information about those numbers updates such that we have an increased probability of understanding in that particular number. So if someone who is a knower three is asked to do to give in the given task to give two, then they have knowledge about two. So the probability of giving two in this case increases because of the prior knowledge. And for questions related to giving two, their prior knowledge, or the probability of giving one or three decreases from this base rate knowledge because the child is presumed to have knowledge up to three. So they have the ability to discriminate between those numbers. Another case where updating would occur is if the child didn't have information about the number and thus we would update the probabilities in such a way where the, let's see, the given number that they gave, the probability of saying that number again. So in this case, if I said give three and the child gave two and they're given the feedback that that was wrong, then the probability of giving two for when asked to give three decreases from their base rate num number knowledge. Though all other numbers would retain the same probabilities ac across the scale. So here we go. Here's the information about the graphical model that we attempted to describe. Excuse me. Q is questions and A is answers. So some correspondence between questions and answers for the I as child and the J as question is what we care about. So the task specific base rate probabilities here is the most important parameter of interest in this theory other than Z is going to be pi. So pi k is the probability of giving k as an answer. So the probability of giving some number 
as an answer for a given individual for a given question. So presumably um, when those uh, components line up, the probability of giving a particular answer uh, increases. So if a, for example, if a child was a no or three and I asked them a question about three, then the probability of them answering that question correct for three is high. And so pi prime is the base rate vector that gets updated uh, across each of the questions in the task. And that logic of how updates occur is the or is formalized above um, in that the specification that I described and is re-described right here. Cool. So the new prime, right, so the new base rate probability for um, giving an answer For a given number, so we'll use the same to our new update, no update if the number is beyond my inference category. If the number is less than my inference category and k is equal to the question, then multiply my inference category by some value and update it. So it's going to go up. But if it's k is less than my inference category, k is not equal to the given question, then we would decrease the probability of giving that answer for a given question. So less likely that I'd say it if it's wrong, and I know it's wrong, or more likely I say it's right if I know it's right. And no change if I the number is larger than my knowledge. So knower level parameters, ZI is given by a categorical prior and there are six possible categories that we have. So these six. And they're given equal probability initially for each subject. So let's take a look at the stand model here, or the JAGS model. Since it looks like we'll be able to. Well, first, let me. <laughs> naturally throughout the series or uncommon to people who've watched our prior episodes is that I mean, Michael Lee and Wagamaker's JAGS code doesn't have the R files for the last couple case studies and that's been a common problem we've run into but it looks like in this case have that problem. Or we will have that problem because it's only Jags. It's only the bugs and not a Jags. stand code because I don't have wind bugs on this computer.
sorry. break that's running so let's put the break here so here's the jack squid for the no level model that we just described where answer for a given individual for a given question it is distributed as a categorical distribution with base rate pi prime so that is the probability of giving the answer correctly object found, no gn object found, no ns object found, elements and arguments, error, alright, tons of errors, I see, I see it. set your working direction. Alright. Let's see if we catch an, a crash here. I think we'll be okay. Well, that runs then. Dirt trip to Diplet. Distribution extension of a beta distribution with two more than two possible options. Just describing some of those. And this is our. Oh, there aren't enough warm up iterations to put two stages, so the adaptation is kind of completed. Okay. Well, how many normal distributions did you write? Oh. This is from 600 iterations, I see. So maybe I'll reset it right after this is done. And it looks a little warm. Results, when we take a look, the probability of see, posterior base rates for giving 1 to 15 toys inferred by applying the NOAA level model to give end data. So people are able, or here's the probability for giving any number of toys. So people or children naturally can have a high probability of giving 1, have a high probability of giving 2. I mean 15 and a high probability of giving 2. Uh, this makes sense in because of the phenomena that we discussed earlier where if a child doesn't have knowledge about a given number it's likely that they just give up all or the total number of toys in a given um, set for that particular task. So in this given uh, subjects have 15 toys and with that being the maximum, if a subject had had no idea about any of these numbers, then it's likely they get 15. So that's why we have this influx of greater 
probability in giving 15. And then we see equal probability across 3, 4, 5. So let's print the samples. Looks like we get one for each of these. Pretty okay, good fits. Not good enough fits, it doesn't look like getting thrown a bunch of errors. Yeah, this looks good. Alright. So let's see the graph we got to. So here's the probability of it being a part of a given knower level for a given child. So child 1, for example, is a cardinal, while child 16 would be knower level 1. And we infer this based on task performance. Okay? For example, we're not really sure about what knower level child 8 might be, though we're fairly certain child 19 is from level four or level three. Any praise? And it looks like overall across the sample children are tend to be on average like it said in no level three. Probabilities for each of the knowers. Whether they get an answer correctly or the pr probability of response. Let's see. The posterior distribution over six possible knower levels for each child. So, child. And that's that. That's a Z. Interested in between the posterior distributions of the model, and you observe behavior for six children. We have question and answer here, and we'd expect, for example, child 15, who is a free knower, has a vast, a lot of distribution of 15 because they don't have much knowledge about any numbers. So the, the given answer that they gave tended to be just giving all the toys because they have more knower level theory, would predict that child 15 did. Had, did not have any concept for numbers. However, if we looked at child 20, we see that for any given trial, the subject answered, the probability that the subject answered that question for that number correctly is high. In fact, it looks like a perfect score where across the diagonal we see even at 12, the subject had 20 had knowledge of 12. So this is a cardinal, or what the theory would propose to be a cardinal uh, principle knower, where they are able to infer information about all numbers on the basis of their um, development in numerical concepts. And then in between that two, so we looked at the two extremes, you can see then uh, in cases like this, where once a child reaches their numeric threshold, the probability of choosing a given option tends to just uh, well first decrease though 
most of the waiting for an answer will be at that maximum. So we see that, that maximum effect of attacks again across children 2, 4, 3, and 10. And so I'm going to look up here for information. So let's get to these questions. Report the posterior for the evidence parameter V. Okay. So I'm just going to go examples. This V. I'll call it V samples. And we'll extract information about V, which I assume that if we look up here that we are monitoring V, the probability for V to remind, like I went up and highlight because I saw that this question was gonna be asked. Let me scroll past. This song, where I took it. Evidence value that measures the strength of upgrading. Okay. I can do like a rib group box. Samples. So here we have the distribution of these samples, which was uniformly distributed from one to a thousand. To remind me, so I'm going to take a look at distribution here quickly in R. See if I can find a good example. Something like distribution, 10,000 samples with a minimum of zero and a maximum of 
sobre contar contar eu vou fazer text contar Yes. So you see, moving from our beautiful and posterior to the histogram, <coughs> this is the average weighting for um, updates on our base rate knowledge the strength of updating right so we had the uniform uniformative prior from zero to a thousand and now here's the relative strength of the updates and we can take a look at some summary statistics that would be nice Change nothing about the distribution other than <laughs> when the parameter comes up in the summary statistics. Interpret the distinctive visual patterns of the posterior predictions. Well, I described this answer already. Um, if you circle back, I talked about that a 15 effect and how across the diagonals uh, was a captured accuracy. strategy seen. The model currently assumes that the farmer does the best method for finding the distribution over all possible classes in proportion to the math associated with each class. Uh, so it assumes that the final sample um, is knowledge from all possible, but it's not accounting for my memory decay or how we've seen in um, prior models, not necessarily decay, but a meshing of prior information. And so if we look at mo the simple model, for example, the memory model in um, some earlier episodes, if we went over a case study, it's possible that the discriminability between um, numbers decays over time and so we might want to incorporate uh, some knowledge about or some information about how uh, the development of or an understanding or an, up, an updating of numeric concepts can also decay over time so it's likely that knowledge learned um, most recently has a larger effect than knowledge learned um, earlier or that's part of what we could expect um, if we were to try to incorporate some kind of decay in memory uh, within our developmental model i'm not sure if that's what the particular question was asking me there i touch on but um, i'm just trying to ride through some of the questions to give you some general ideas about what i thought so let's take a look at the summary statistics here. It should work, yeah. So average update in knowledge was about 
83, and we, we sampled from zero to a thousand, so that's pretty strong evidence. And it's, well, there's quite uh, an amount of variance in the, in the type of updating, and that makes sense because for, uh, this is, the strength in updating is a, in some sense a, a measure of learning, right? But for, uh, this is across the overall sample, so how much weight did um, updating your prior about number, what, what was the strength of the update it tended to be across the, our entire sample? But you could imagine that we could have individual differences in this updating where a subject who maybe was learning more quickly updated knowledge about numbers uh, larger or I, I had a larger base number there So here then, explain why the distribution shown in 19.2 is not exactly posterior of the base rate pi. What distribution is shown? How is this related? Okay, let's see, 19.2. Answer this question, we can take a look at the code and see the plotting for that particular. Make sure that this is what we're talking about. Yep. Okay. So, what's plotted here is the predicted pi and y is predicted pi not representative of pi. Our predicted pi isn't the base rate, it's the predicted base rate based on pi. So we're not looking at the distribution of the base rates, we're looking at the predicted probability of a number corresponding to an, a correct answer before any knowledge about Where the knowledge about the numbers is updated, right? So it's a posterior predictive check. Oh, no, 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 it's a... Yeah, the updated base rate parameter here, so it's still the posterior distribution, but it's demonstrating what would be the spread of of the correct answers given the updated uh, posterior. So this is a way to check the quality of our model, posterior predictive check, which wasn't as discussed, or there was a pretty hefty discussion here, but I'd say that most of the discussion in this book talked about doing or building uh, models from the sample parameter set. And there are other strategies for doing posterior predictive checks not assessed here that incorporate um, machine learning strategies, though we won't touch on those in this um, series. But I do recommend you go and check some of these out because they're sort of the in vogue way for checking out of prediction sampling for uh, posterior distributions, which is important if we want to use these models in the real world. So, hmm. this is a 
interesting. It's just a little diatribe about this particular model is sort of, <laughs> sort of funny because not only is, are we using a Bayesian inference strategy to, to understand you know, some of the components of the model, but we're also you know, taking the idea of you know, Bayesian updating to develop a you know, cognitive model for how this you know, probabilistically is occurring within the mind of a child. So we have this notion of Bayes in the head, where you know, Bayesian inf inference is what the mind does in some sense, and you know, we can try to account for cognition using you know, a, a Bayesian framework for how the the, the brain is updating or how the mind uh, updates information, which is a contested approach for understanding psychological phenomena. However, um, that's one way to think about it. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at the NOLA level model for fast cards, which Taking a look here, we have questions, we have answers, we have F, so it's the same framework, but now if you take a look at the second plate, J uh, corresponds to fast card questions. So we're just looking at a different set of questions, whether they got them correct or not, still feeds into this prior probability for a given question for um, a given subject, and we infer their learner strategy level. Um, and in this case, let me make sure we still have some base rate prior across the sample and some uh, base rate you know, value f or quality of updating. Uh, or the strength of the update. And we use the same set of uniform priors, an equal uh, cate category, equal probability for any given child to be um, within any learner category and then this logic represented here to describe how a base rate understanding about numbers is updated for a given subject, for a given number, for a given question. And then we can model A, so the answer. So the answer for a given subject, for a given question right, is understood from this probability of knowledge about from that given subject for that given question and which we can then represent in a posterior predictive check using that graph that we just discussed so same framework here but different task so let's see how um, some of the task components might bear themselves out in the model here so um, I think some of the differences we can expect then is that for values like 15 that were A component of the fast end task that was particularly relevant and needed to be accounted for might not be as relevant in the uh, fast card task because you know subjects aren't just going to give in all of the toys that they have um, because they didn't have enough knowledge about the number right so it's less crucial in terms of our uh, or it won't be a component that we need to account for when we're interpreting the predictive models for the number con number um, number of probability of answering a number correct for that distribution or it sh shouldn't be and we'll test that so here we go and here's the number for the fast end task which we go up notice the distribution of numbers we can ask subjects about is larger and that there's no longer this spike in um, answering 15 because there's nothing about this particular task that eh, makes 15 as a value theoretically interesting. So this is a task specific component that is bared out in our behavioral data. Um, and we only have knowledge about this particular spike because of our understanding of the task specific components. And so once again, we can take a look at the probability um, distributions for uh, inferring 
a given subject, uh, here children being from any of the particular categories, and we see there being correspondence between some of the uh, classifications here where subject 20 is still you know, a gold noodle, <laughs> golden star child, no other numbers, and was still able to answer things like 50, um, or at least guess 50, but we can take a look, uh, let's see, let's see. We can take a look at the probability of any given category now looking at or answering a question correctly. And we see for those CP knowers that they really um, have a lot, um, a good sense on applying numbers up to a certain extent. And then on average, then some knowers can move beyond that, but uh, it, it, this perfection curve or this like really, really accuracy it caps out around 10. Um, or at least uh, that's the limits of our graph here. But we saw that we asked subjects up to 50 or some subject answered 50 but looks like we asked them 20. but notice the p and knowers is like quite flat in terms of the probability of answering any set of numbers um, but it's not likely that they answered anything really high because you know, knowing what those numbers are is very unlikely um, given that the child has even no numeric concept for things like one in the first place. So we put the posterior for the evidence parameter V and compare it to the value from the given test. Okay, so let me open up two stuff around and look at the easier by moving it there I'm gonna increase this to 1600 and we're gonna do the same amount of warm-ups so 600 warm-ups here and then after the extract of the sample we're just going to okay and now okay I'll let that run the posterior distributions over knower levels to figure three. So, right, so how do these correspond with these? And like I said, they look like they correspond here. So we felt subject 20 was spot on. Let's look at child one. Child one, pretty spot on still, right? Easy helper. Um, but what about lower? So those are for higher. What about people who are not so good? So child eight and child, uh, let's see, child eight and child 16. Let's see. So for those child and child eight, well, child eight, so while we had this variability about where they were, now we are pretty confident in, uh, in where they are. Child 16, same. So it seems like we're much more confident about a subject's uh, place, at least for these particular two subjects. However, if you look at subject 19, we're less confident. Subject 17, so let's take a look at 17 and 19. And then given 17 and 19, though, we are confident. So what we see then, or what we're able to see here, is that... Sorry. What we're able to see is that the models, the inferred uh, learner uh, knower level for a given subject uh, can vary across uh, tasks here so it would be interesting to uh, combine information from both tasks in order to understand the knower level for a given subject uh, especially since that we would make different predictions about what uh, a given s s individual's uh, knower level might be based on their task performance uh, okay. right. yes. so let's 
take a look at that chart. Oh, we got a random Strago chart there. Uh, he's doing V samples from the first. He's doing V samples from the second. So you see the. Now the average update is much, much smaller. So the average update for the first, the given task was in the 80s for the app. And then it had this very uh, tight distribution, but teetered off around 250. But if you look here, now it looks like we have a tighter distribution with respect to the last one, which had uh, substantial variability. It was uh, like a double digit number, at least in terms of difference, like 60 or something. And, uh, the value is also larger. So in terms of location and, uh, and scale, V across the two tasks uh, differed considerably. And the amount of, or the strength of the updates of information is substantially lower for V samples for the second task. Patterns of uncertainty here arise. Yeah, having probability mass in levels of category Z that are large or could be inferred across multiple um, Zs. So the Z posterior for child two, pull that out here. Um, can I print example? Print samples here, and we'll print sample. Extract sample Z two six. Extract sample Z two. Do a summary of the extracted sample. So we have two, we have six. And six is supposed to correspond to some value. So if you we were just looking at the Z value, uh, it's not clear that it would correspond. It's not clear that the Z values represented as just these um, numeric 
indicator for which category it's from. the 20 subjects, each of the, in this case, uh, 2,000 samples. I have a predicted value for that given uh, sample. So when we see probability mass corresponding um, to two different categories, it's because Z was predicted to be um, consistently from those two different categories. Um, while if we saw for subject 20, for example, we're only going to have probability distribution mass in six across the whole sample of all 2000. So there's no mass for any of the other knower levels. So when, in question two, when it talks about there being uncertainty in the knower level, Z captures this uncertainty by just showing that it's possible that this particular subject could be from two or knower level two or knower level one or knower level two. And we're not really sure which, and that's represented in the uncertainty uncertainty here just being represented by um, the probability of them being from any no given knower level distributed across two levels. But if you look at 19, you can have distributed across several levels here. So that also is an indication of the uncertainty surrounding um, the knower level for that given child. So the number of bars, I guess is the easiest way to say this, the number of bars for a given chart here captures um, our uncertainty surrounding that child's uh, numeric uh, competency level. Okay, so lastly, last section of the book here, now we're just going to take so what we saw then, just to sum up, we saw that across um, both tasks, we will, were able to infer information about a given child's knower level and then predict or understand or, or predict across each of the numbers what was the probability that um, on the group level, a given child would be able to uh, correctly identify that number and then answer a question correctly. And what we saw was variability in this ability to do that um, task across both tasks. So to say that again, the given and the fast cards task had different predictions for a knower level for any given child. So for a specific child so for example for child 19 we saw that the given task predicted that that child was from like knower level three or four but the fast end cards task was uh, distributed the posterior distribution across like four knower levels so that task wasn't able to discriminate what knower level the given child was from but though both of the tasks are couched in this theory of knower levels and thus we're able to classify subjects into this theory using both of the tasks so we should be able to then conceptually since we're using the same uh, parameters here to just incorporate information about both tasks into the inferred knower level group for a given subject and that's what this final model does here where we're going to have uh, base rates and update um, strengths for each of the knower levels so this Z's to the power of G or F, G being representative of one task and F being representative of the other. And we're just combining both of those into a single model and then allowing Z then to be described by information from both of them, both models. So 
we should see some correspondence in the predictions between um, the two tasks. So for subjects like subject 20, where they were rep they got all the questions right for the first task, and then they got a lot of the questions right for the second task. The prediction shouldn't change if we incorporate mo um, information from both models. But for a subject where it was uncertain in one task and certain in the other, you know, it would be this model is going to be able to provide us some additional certainty regarding that particular or, or what knower, knower level we would expect that child to be based on information from or performance from both tasks. So we can implement this model using this uh, graphical model and I'll pull up the code for that. Last one right there. I'm going to go in and change a couple things because 600 iterations doesn't seem like enough. I'm going to do 1600 iterations again with a burn in period of 600. And make a, and let's look and we'll find this model. And we get a bunch of diagnostic parser errors. Stan will still run the model with those errors. It's just in terms of syntax, those are improper now so we could go in and change all those but we are coming in on the last four minutes so let's try to get through these last questions so if you the first thing we can notice then if we just look at the posterior predictions for a given um, across the given children for the uh, probability of them being from any uh, knower group is that we see a lot more cases of single bars so keep in mind that what we described before was that the uncertainty surrounding uh, the predictions for a given knower level for a given child um, was distributed across having multiple of these uh, bars for um, predictions of knower levels. Well, now that we see single bars for each of these children, uh, that indicates more precise predictions about what knower level a given child is from. And so more single bars tells us that information from both models was able to then account for the discrepancies or the uncertainties that we had about what a particular knower level a given child might be from. Um, however, it for child six here, it looks like we have actually introduced some uncertainty. So let's go take a look at the knower levels from the past examples. So for task one, we saw two bars and then task two bars. So it looks like it was already uncertain in those across the two bars. So we weren't able to alleviate any of that uncertainty when we uh, considered both task performance in the aggregate. And then we can also look at the uh, Still running the chains. Okay. Okay, 19.3. Right, so as we already said, the childs are confidently inferred to being known from a single load. The key point to take away then from this example is just that using both sources of empirical evidence simultaneously provided us with clearer inferences. And another interesting component about this is that we captured information about the overarching theory from two different tasks. And so this would be a useful strategy for psychologists moving forward if they wanted to have some overarching uh, theory about how cognition worked but they wanted to vary how they went about capturing aspects of that cognitive process. And using a Bayesian framework, then they could incorporate information about both of the of tasks. We, they could incorporate information from both of the tasks in order to understand the overarching theory 
but people don't take this uh, next step, right? They normally just infer information from the parameters from their model and don't try to uh, corroborate uh, information across tasks into one unified set of parameters that could then be used to infer some characteristics about cognition in that um, population. So lessons to be learned here in terms of good psychology. Looks like we have our last question here and we're coming down to the last uh, 30 seconds. So <laughs> I'm gonna go over us a bit to answer the last question. Let's see what it is. Okay, so we have the answers for a given subject, and it wants us to explain why there were discrepancies in the knower level inferred across the two tasks, where the given task, the knower level was inferred to be either, let's take a look at the graphs, subject 18, Knower level looked like it was going to be knower level four, with a low probability for knower level three. However, if we take a look at the next task, 18, knower level three, high probability, and no probability of any other knower level. But when we look at the combined probability between the two models, we end up with being knower level three. And it wants us to ask why. Why did predictions from one model give us extremely um, high probabilities for an, a knower level that was ultimately incorrect when we accounted for information from both tasks? What characteristics about the particular task might have influenced our inferences about the uh, classification of that given child. So what, based on what we know about the given task, okay, we have to take a look at the patterns of responses in the given. Well, it's clear here that if we take a look at the combined answers, the subject performed perfectly up to three and then performed relatively well on question four for the given task with responses four, five, and four. And then for five, they horrendous, right? So that's why it probably cardinal or the the highest probability wasn't inferred for that subject because their performance starts to um, depreciate around five. But notice for four, they responded uh, relatively well with uh, two fours and a five. So by mere chance, it seems like they were able to perform relatively well in the given task. Yet, if you look at their response, uh, their responses on the fast card task, their answers to question four are just as random or seemingly random as their answers to question ten on the given task. It doesn't look like they had any knowledge of four 
in, in that path. So while they might have been guessing in the, or if you only looked at the answers from the given, it might look like that they knew what the number four was. But based on their answers from the fast card task, it didn't look like they knew what number four was. So because they didn't perform perfectly on the, on the given task for number four, and they performed really, really poorly on the fast card task, that ultimately when we account for differences in task performance for this given child, we infer that they're from the Miller level three. And that's the answer to the question. So that's the, all the questions in the book. Thank you for following along for the series. Here are the references. We have officially done it. I hope to try to do more things like this in the future. Maybe not live streams. I have some uh, projects on my mind that I'd like to try to do in this setting. Particularly, it would be really cool to do just explain videos for how to do particular types of analyses or how to interpret analyses and just go through those or how we could go and do some exploratory analysis on some um, data set we find or that's of interest um, online that uses real world psychology data I think would be really cool to do something on um, or more exercises in different books those are also like fun but that would be more live streamy moving forward I think instructional videos would also be really cool to do but this has been a valuable learning experience overall for how to go about doing this sort of streaming on YouTube and I certainly learned a lot about how to implement some of these models both in Winbugs and JAGS and this is um, project has um, integrated nicely into uh, a class I've been taking at my university so this has been really helpful in developing some higher level conceptual pictures about how to interpret the outputs for these sorts of things as in my class I dive deeper into what are some of the um, underpinnings or um, sort of mathematical frameworks underlying a lot of these strategies that we are using here. So I'm getting really the, the full picture. So thanks for tuning in and I look forward to trying to do some of these things, things like this in the future. And feel free to reach out via email or um, whatever social platform uh, you feel privy to. I list a variety of them on my uh, channel.